So glad you're able to make it, all of you. And uh, I hope you're having a good holiday season with friends and family. And we're continuing today in Hebrews. And I'm just going to pray and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and meet in your name and for your sake. We thank you for those that we've been praying for who you have healed and pray for others who are still uh, having uh, problems. But we know, Lord, that you are the great healer and uh, we just trust you with our lives. Lord, I pray you be with Jacob today as he teaches and please bless the, the, our learning from your word to the Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Okay, dear friends, thank you so much for joining us. Midweek Moriel Bible Study. Hope you're having a blessed holiday season in the Lord. Uh, despite the way the world is going, we're going in a different way. And our way is going to be much, much better, to say the very least. But you think the world is in bad shape now, just wait. That's going to get much, much worse. Our world can only get better. It may get worse before it gets better, but ultimately our world can only get better. The world, the fallen world, can only get worse. Interim periods of respite, maybe, but ultimately it can only get worse. And the only difference is Jesus has shown us grace and mercy. Praise his wonderful, wonderful name. Hallelujah. A couple of very brief announcements. Um, <clears throat> we will be continuing with our normal program Last week, everything else is ready to continue as normal this week, although some features have been pre-recorded, particularly on RTN. We will be doing catching up as usual, and we will uh, resume our normal Bible studies next week. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, I'll be coming to the USA uh, very soon to New York City, to the Church of the Open Door, I'll be speaking also in Baltimore. I'll be speaking also in the suburbs of Los Angeles with Marco and DeVor. And I'll be speaking with Pastor Rob Finberg in Maui and Hawaii. Uh, the dates are on the Moriel website on the itinerary page. Also in the UK, Pastor Tim Leach and myself and Mark Jackson, who directs Moriel's work in India, we will be speaking on the 20th. 5th of February at the Moriel Church in Winsford in Cheshire in the north of England. And the following day, which is a Sunday, the 26th, I'll be speaking at the Moriel Church in Manchester area near Hyde. Uh, that is also to be posted or is posted on the website. A following week after that, I will be in Reading, England with Pastor John Anglis of CMFI. Christian Ministers Fraternal International, and I shall be at a fellowship called The Ark. The Ark, I will pass to John Anglis one week later. Um, then there's the United States. Into March, we are planning to have our day conference in the Edinburgh area of Scotland. Uh, that will be a very good conference, but we have had uh, to make some adjustments in our plans to have John Haller over. A lot of people were not happy, I think justifiably, with only having John over for a day seminar and maybe to shoot a TV um, interview or something of that nature. They wanted him here for longer. So what we're doing instead is planning a residential conference either at the beginning of the summer, which will be in late spring, early summer, which will either be in June or at the end of the summer, which will be in September, that will also be in Scotland. We will have John Haller over for that, Lord willing, a bit further down the line. But in the meantime, we have an itinerary in the USA, and we have um, dates in the north, the north of England, and also in the London, outer London suburbs in the Reading area, the Ark Fellowship uh, in Hampshire, England. That's coming up all within the next six to eight weeks. So it is. We're continuing in Hebrews. And uh, we looked at Melchizedek as the framework 
for what we're going to look at tonight for a reason. Chapters 5 through 10, uh, 5 through 10, 5 through 10 of Hebrews are the priestly, the priestly portion of the epistles, the priestly portion of the epistles. But the priestly portion is divided into two halves. The Melchizedek portion, which deals with Melchizedek as a Christophany, an Old Testament apparition of Christ, the Melchizedek portion, and the Aaronic portion, that is the Levitical from Aaron, the first high priest. And that deals, of course, with the typology of the Levitical sacrificial system. So we'll be doing that next, but now we're still finishing the first half of the priestly portion, having constructed a paradigm in which to do so, um, which is basically organized as lo looking at it in light of, of, of Melchizedek, which we studied last week. I know it's holiday season and people have a lot on. We don't want to keep you too late, but we'll see how far we get. I'd like to finish the first half of the priestly portion tonight. If you'll very graciously turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because it is because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor of <clears throat> to himself but receives it when he was called by God, even as Aaron was called. So Christ also did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Just as he says also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, in the days of his flesh. Although he offered up both prayers and supplications, with loud crying and tears to the one who's able to save him from death. He was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to this order of Melchizedek. Now let's Look at what this is telling us. It begins by speaking about something called Mekudesh. Mekudesh. In some contexts, Mekudesh is the Hebrew term for to marry. But here it is speaking of the ritual the high priest had to undergo before he could enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. Because he was one of the people before he could sacrifice on behalf of the people and come before the Lord in the Holy of Holies, he had to first, he was obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. So the Aaronic high priest was a man with weaknesses, with a fallen nature, with everything the same as we are. We see the virtues and the flaws right from the beginning in Aaron himself with the golden calf. And we see the unfortunate realities of his backslidden sons. It was a flawed priesthood from the beginning. However, the righteous priests, and there were righteous priests in that order, Aaron was righteous, he just made some bad mistakes. But although there were righteous high priests in that order, they still were human with sin. And how can somebody go make atonement for the sin of the people when they have sinned themselves? Hence, there was this ritual called Mekudesh, and it had to put blood on the thumb and so forth. You can, you can read about it in the Torah. Uh, <clears throat> he had to be Mekudesh, set apart, set apart. 
Now, Mekudesh means God sets them apart. God sets them apart. Mekudesh is a very, very important word in biblical Hebrew. And it has ramifications to our understanding of the gospel and ramifications for our understanding of marriage and family. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I find deficient in so much of Christian marriage counseling, and I'm not into I'm not into counseling myself. It's not my gifting or calling, but I realize the importance of pastoral ministry. One of the well, the primary issue I have with so much of what is written on that subject of, of Christian marriage is a lot of it does not begin with a good theology of marriage. It does not begin with a good theology of marriage. This idea of Mekudesh is absolutely important. Absolutely important. It is easier to understand Mekudesh in the Levitical sense if you understand it in the marital sense, okay? Yeshua, Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Notice he does not say who God has joined together. He says what God has joined together. You see people, I've even heard Christians say this. Oh, we were young and we thought we were in love and we made a mistake and we lacked discernment and we were not believers very long, and we 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 got married, and, and we realized we were not compatible, and we shouldn't have married. We married outside of the Lord's will, and so we got divorced, and now we're married to other people, and we're going to live happily ever after. I know a, a Calvary Chapel pastor, nice guy, and his wife, who both did that. They had both been married as young believers, got divorced, no biblical grounds, no infidelity or anything like that. And, and just said, we were young, we made a mistake, but now God's forgiven us and we're married to each other and we have a ministry and a family. It is not who, it is what. The marital union itself, because it reflects the divine image and likeness of the Godhead, is more important than the who's. <laughs> it is not about the individuals primarily. It is about the institution and about the union, about the union, okay? In a emergency situation, okay, the police come to assist people in a crime or a major automobile accident or something terrible. There are two issues with a policeman. What he is as an individual, but what he is as a policeman. During that emergency, the shootout, the accident, the rescuing people from cars, because very often the police are the first responders. They can get there before an ambulance or a rescue squad. Okay. Whatever he may be or she may be as an individual is secondary. It's the uniform, it's the badge, it's the position they're in. That is greater than the individual. So it is in holy matrimony. It is mekudesh. The what is primary. The who is secondary. Because it is mekudesh. What does Mekudesh mean? To make holy. What does make holy mean? Literally, to set apart. Holiness, that which is Kodesh, Kodesh, holy, is set apart. Its opposite, what we would call unholy, is profane, profane. You take something that is set apart and you make it common. You make it common. Just think of the word profanity, okay? In marital intimacy, okay, there's romance and there's obviously going to be sexual conversation, okay? But it's set apart. It's set apart to those people. God has set it apart to the people who are married. If they fool around premaritally or extramaritally, 
something that should be made kudesh, something that should be set apart becomes common, common. They make it not set apart, it's common instead of specific or, or designated, limited. Okay, that is what profanity means in, in, in Hebrew now. Okay, so let's understand this. The high priest could go in once a year to the Holy of Holies because he was Mekudesh. He was set apart by God to do it. Notice, he was set apart by God to do it. He could not set himself apart to do it. No one can set themselves apart to a ministry. I want to be this. I want to do that. Now, the Lord gives us the desire of our hearts. If someone wants to be a missionary or something like this, the Lord may indeed call them to it. Nobody is uh, discouraging uh, a, a godly desire. But ultimately, it must be God's will, not ours. People often look upon ministry as they would a career. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a maxillofacial surgeon. I want to uh, be an automobile mechanic and open my own business. I want to be this. I want to be an investment banker. I want to be that. I want to be. It's like a career. What do you want to do? Well, unfortunately, in a consumerist society as we have today, many people, many people, and there are churches that encourage this, many people, choose a ministry the way they choose a career. Remember, it was the spirit that said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul. It wasn't Barnabas and Saul. Here, of course, it is the same thing. The Lord had to set apart that high priest. The Lord had to set it apart. We cannot choose a ministry on our own. We can have a desire, and if the desire is godly, that desire may be something God has put in our heart to indicate to us what the ministry he has for us to do is. And every Christian has a ministry. We're not all in full-time ministry. We're not all in leadership ministry, but we all have a ministry. If you have a, a desire in your heart, that may indeed be something that the Lord has put there as one indicator as to what he wants you to do. Well, the same thing begins to happen across the board. The Lord shows you what it is he wants you to do. Some people have had all kinds of plans, myself being one of them, but God had other things for me to do. What I wanted had to go to the cross. I had to be crucified and laid down. He gave me what he wanted instead, which in the long term is always going to be better in the longer term. We cannot choose our ministries. Make who God must set someone apart. We've talked about this before from Exodus 30. I don't want to go into it now, but on our various teachings, be careful of those who say you can arbitrarily transfer an anointing. Exodus 30 tells us as an abomination, the oil is holy to you. It's mekudesh, it is specific, God given to you. You cannot transfer an anointing or a calling. Elijah could not give his mantle to Elijah. It had to fall from the chariot. God had to give it to him. We cannot choose our own calling. We cannot choose our own ministry. We must be set apart to it by God, and it's not transferable. Same as you can't transfer your husband or your wife to someone else sexually. It's an abomination to try to transfer, you know, these swingers and these things that the world has. That stuff's an abomination because God has set apart this guy and this woman, and that's it. Okay. 
It's an ab- well, it is co-equally abominable. Again, I, we, I refer you to some of our teachings citing Exodus 30. It's co-equally abominable to try to transfer something that is make kudesh. It is holy unto you. Holy unto you. We can imitate people's virtues. We can learn from their mistakes and from their successes. We can have mentors, older brothers and sisters in the Lord. We can have all of that. And God uses those things. But Mekudesh is something God must do. It is not something that people can do. Okay. So the Aaronic high priest was Mekudesh. For him to enter the, and again, we deal with this on our teaching, I think, on the book of Ruth. For the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies, he had to be the one who was Mekudesh and undergo this ritual, okay, before he could enter. Now, once a year on Yom Kippur, he could enter. <clears throat> Any Jew could read the Torah and read about the showbread and the Decalogue and the Holy Ark. Any Jew could is inside the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim in Hebrew, Sanctum Sanctorum. Anybody could read the Torah and know what's in there, objectively. But subjectively and experientially, only the high priest who foreshadows Christ is to know what it's like to go in there. If anyone else goes in there, it's an abomination, a desecration. When we see people in Scripture entering the Holy of Holies, other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement, and we see John the Baptist's father in that role, okay, if we see anyone else do it, it's a type of the Antichrist. The Roman general Pompey entered. There was, well, obviously Antiochus Epiphanes. Whenever you see somebody messing with the Holy of Holies, other than the one who was made Kudesh, they typify the Antichrist because the Antichrist will enter and set up the abomination of desolations. This is in our book, uh, uh, Shadows of the Beast. We go into it, obviously, in, in much more detail and depth than we do here. I'm only mentioning it. So only the one who was made Kudesh could know what it was like to go in there, even though everybody can know what was in there. Well, just think about a marriage, a marital consummation. Anybody can, well, you can get it online now, I suppose. Anybody can get a, a textbook of uh, Gray's Clinical Anatomy. It's the most famous, at least when I was a kid, it was Gray's Clinical Anatomy. And you can go on to Gray's Clinical Anatomy and you can look at micro slides of fallopian tubes and of uh, ovarian tissue and of ovum page after page at different phases of the menstrual cycle and ovulation and things like this. You have micro slides page after page after page. You can know what is in there anatomically. Okay. Anybody can read it. But only the person who is Mekudesh, set apart by God, is to know what it is like to go in there. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If someone other than the husband who is Mekudesh, the husband being the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, if someone other than the husband goes in there sexually, okay. It's a desecration of God's temple. You know, a a woman who sleeps around isn't being loved. She's being desecrated. God's temple is being violated. If she's a Christian, she's backslidden into into immorality. She's not being loved. She's being violated because there's no make Kudesh. Well, the same thing. If anybody went into the Holy of Holies, God's temple was being desecrated. Okay, only God can make Kudesh. <laughs> it's, tra- it's not easy to translate the Hebrew. The Kadesh to make one, you can, the Kadesh, make oneself holy is the term. But make Kudesh, only God can sanctify us. It is the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. 
He sanctifies us to himself. He makes us holy. Okay. Israel was to be a holy nation. That is, he set, he set Israel apart unto himself. Israel didn't set themselves apart unto him. He set them apart unto himself. Okay. Only God can make Kudesh, God alone. Now, that's very important when we understand things like matrimony, obviously. It's important when we understand the gospel. Jesus was the one set apart to do it. The Aaronic high priest was a shadow, but he was in a different order of Melchizedek. Here became the problem. The Aaronic high priest had sin. When he went in there, he experientially knew what he was applying the blood for. He knew the sin of the people because he was one of the people and had the same sin himself. Jesus had no sin. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he had no sin. He came in the likeness of it. In other words, he would have he would have had teething, teething fever as a baby. He would have had, you know, <laughs> headaches or whatever. He would have been subject to the same things we are. Illnesses that came about as a result of the fall would have affected Jesus for a different reason. Not because he had sin, but because we had sin and he came to identify with us. He came in our likeness. His body would have aged and everything the same as we are, even though the cause of it was not the same because he had no sin. He just took ours. Okay. Now, what do you do? You got this person who's a high priest but he can only relate to the people up to a certain point because he did not have a fallen nature. He was not descended from Adam. He was the second Adam. He was preexistent, the eternal son of God. He did not know sin. He knew what sin was. He had an objective understanding of what sin was, obviously, but he had no subjective experience of it. So how does somebody who can't relate to sin experientially go in on behalf of the people? There had to be a process through which God could do this. How could he represent us when he's not one of us? Well, part of this answer is something we studied, if you remember, Back in Philippians, kenosis, he reduced himself to our level. Again, I always think of the Mark Twain novel, The Prince and the Pauper, or the Disney movie, about Edward VI, the docufiction, when he becomes a, as a, as a, as a waif, as a street kid in London, even though he was the prince and then the king, he identified with the people, the power of his royal office did him no good. Well, the power of Jesus' deity did him no good while he was here identifying with us. I think Mark Twain must have read the scriptures to have written that particular book because it follows a very biblical theme. It's some of the great authors I've read and know of always did that. You know, Dostoevsky certainly did that, and so, so did Mark Twain. They followed a biblical theme. The reduction of one person to our level. Okay, well, let's continue now. May Kudesh. How does it happen? All right, he's designated. He's set apart by God to do it, but in the order of Melchizedek. Now, let's look, please, at verses 7 to 9. He offered up prayers and supplications with a loud voice, crying with tears to the one able to save him, his father from death. And he was heard because of his piety. His father saved him from death by resurrection. But he still had to die biologically because he was accursed for our sin. Now the word here, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Having been made perfect. 
Teleotheus. Teleotheus. Teleo. The end objective. The end objective. What the first atom was intended to be. The teleotheus of the first atom. And all who are born of Adam, our teleo peace never happened. But it did happen with Jesus. He succeeded where we failed. The second Adam succeeded where the first one failed. And he succeeded as a high priest of a different order where the Aaronic high priest failed. Because the Aaronic high priest was still a human. He had this cup, what are we, get the Yom Kippur, there was a covering for his sin, but he had sin. Jesus had no sin, just took ours. This is how it happened. This is how it happened. Jesus reached the teleotheus. The aim of God, the teleotheus for you and for me, for every saved Christian, is to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. He reached it. What God's intent, target, the acme of God's will and wish for people to be, Jesus Christ achieved, but nobody else did. It is only in him that God looks upon us as complete, as teleotheus, because again, as we know, he took our sin to give us his righteousness. Now, this relates to a lot of other things, justification and so forth, but I don't want to deviate. Helio Theus, the Lord Jesus as our high priest, was able to do that which Aaron and the Aaronic high priests could not do. Okay. Now notice, not because he had sinned, but for our sake, Jesus had to learn to do the Father's will. He learned to do the will of his father, not his own. We see this in Gethsemane. From the things he suffered, having been made perfect, he reaches Teleotheus. Okay. But he did it by doing the father's will obedience in verse 8. So with us, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. We didn't do it, but we can get it from him if we do what he did. Father, take this cup from me. I don't want this. But your will be done, not mine. Oh, boy. How many times have any one of us said, God, I hope this is not your will. Take this cup from me. But to say your will be done, not mine. That is what Jesus did. And of course, what God was causing him to do or calling him to do is a lot more difficult than anything any of us could ever have to be called to do. That's for sure, certain. What Jesus went through on the cross was greater than all the suffering of all the rest of us put together because he had no sin and he was God's son eternally and was separated from his father because of us, because of our stupidity and our rebellion. But he achieved the teleotheus that Adam didn't, that Aaron didn't, that nobody did. And we can get it from him. Providing we get it the way he did. 
having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him, doing his will as he did the will of the Father. Many things here. The Lord, various times in our life, calls us to do things or give up things or take on things that are challenges. There have been three times in my life, three times in my life, where by the calling of God, the Lord took away all of my financial security. All of it. The first time I was a young guy and I was financially loaded and I was in New York. And the Lord called me to the mission field and I had to go through all this breaking in my life, but I was single. Then we get a place in Israel and everything. And, you know, we're living there and there was no mortgage. We got that. And, you know, we had the kids and we we're just beginning to. No. Now I want you to go to Britain to seminary. We had to sell this and sell the house and sell it, get the money to go to. But I lost everything to come to Israel. Now you're telling me to give this up. Yeah. Trust me. Then it happens again. I was an evangelistic director with a mission to the Jews that was basically conservatively Pentecostal. And when the word faith money preachers began coming into Britain from America and South Africa, and when the counterfeit revivals, the drunken laughing trash from Toronto and Pensacola, when these spiritual counterfeits, these demonic delusions, much of it, came, I was, of course, ostracized. As soon as I began getting a piece of the pie, I'm a speaker at major conferences and things like that in Britain. Lon, I, I had the most watched, I'm not boasting about anything, just God's grace. I had the most watched Christian TV show, not internet TV, satellite TV. I had the most watched Christian TV show in Great Britain at one point, and maybe in Western Europe, but certainly in Great Britain, the most watched. And they broke their word and they bought in Benny Hinn and I quit and they went on two, three weeks denouncing me and my friends saying we were Pharisees. And I lost everything. Oh, you're not on TV anymore. Oh, well, you're not around. You lost your house. You lost your job. You lost your money. <laughs> I always think of brother Jim Elliott and boy, He's one of the guys in heaven I really want to meet, <clears throat> who was martyred, of course, of Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Legendary Brother Jim Elliott. No man is a fool who gives up what he cannot possibly keep in order to gain what he cannot possibly lose. Now, that's just me. And again, I hope no one thinks I'm boasting about how spiritual I am. I'm not so spiritual. Believe me, God had to deal with me in most of those situations to make me willing to do it. I was not so spiritual. Yes, Lord, here I am. <laughs> I tried to negotiate my way out of it <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I'm not so spiritual. But praise God, his will was done. The only way a complete vagabond like me could ever be teleotheus is if Jesus gives it to me. How did he get it? He did the will of the Father. How can we get it? How can I get it? How can you get it? The same way we do God's will. That's what it's saying. So. It's drawing a contrast between the imperfect priesthood. Remember, right from the beginning, Aaron, the first high priest with the golden calf, and then his sons, the priesthood was messed up. Then as you go on later into the Hasmonean period with John Hedekonis after the Maccabees, 
And then you get to the time of the Sadducees and the Gospels, Caiaphas and Ananias. These were corrupt high priests who conspired to have their own Messiah murdered. But they were the Levitical high priesthood. They were the Levitical high priesthood. Most of the people in the clergy who, in the Sanhedrin who wanted Jesus dead, there were Pharisees and Sadducees both, but the Sadducees mainly did it. The Sadducees to this day are considered to have been heretics by ultra-Orthodox Jews. That's interesting. Ananias and Caiaphas and these guys are even cursed by rabbinic Judaism as heretics to this day. It's very interesting, but I don't want to go into that now. But it is interesting to those who are involved in evangelizing Jewish people. Let's continue. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to go on about the things we did last week and the week before. We're just looking at these salient points in light of what we studied last week in the context of Merkitzedek, of Melchizedek. To understand these things, what's going to come next, let's go back to the gospel, please, of St. Matthew for a moment. Turn with me to Matthew 13. I think that's where I put it. Verse 3, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell next to the road. And the birds came and ate them up, those are demons. Others fell upon the rocky places. They didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up. They seemed to grow quickly, but they had no depth. When the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered. But then, verse 7, others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. So far, three of the four seeds don't yield good fruit. Others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Unfortunately, hyper-Calvinists don't have very good hearing. Let's continue, please. Pushing ahead to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 6. Last week, we looked at the distinction between milk and meat. With regards to milk, basic doctrines about baptism and resurrection and repentance and eternal judgment, etc., etc. And this we shall do if God permits. We shall also go back to basic doctrines. You may be saved for 50 years, but once in a while, it's good to listen to a salvation message, to an evangelistic sermon, isn't it? You know everything the evangelist is going to say. He's not saying anything that you have not known for 50 years, but it's still refreshing. Good to hear it. Good to go back to the basic things. These things we shall do if God permits. Again, I have in the past referred to the biography, autobiography of the American gridiron football coach, Vince Lombardi. If his team lost a game, or even if they won a game, but didn't play as well as he thought they should have, <laughs> the next day, early, 
he'd be out on the practice field and he wouldn't be practicing plays and and and, th- and things like that. You know, they want they do an autopsy on the game that they just lost or didn't play that well in, and they watch everything and they say we could have done this better, we, you should have done that, I could have done this. They 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 do a post mortem on the game. But before he would do that, he would have the team on the field and they would practice things like blocking. <laughs> And throwing passes and, and kicking. <laughs> you know, that's what he did. He'd always go back to the fundamental things. Well, that's kind of what is being stated here. These things we shall do if God permits. If you think about algorithms, all the time in your job. Say you're an engineer or a mathematician or a physicist, and you're always think- thinking, or you're a computer scientist, and you're always thinking about algorithms. Okay. Always thinking about algorithms. Okay. Well, unless you understand things like algebra and calculus, you can't really deal with algorithms much. But if you can't deal with arithmetic, you can't deal with algebra. It's always good to go back to basic things sometimes. Don't become disconnected from the foundations. That's what this text is saying. But it also complains that people get stuck with the basic things. They get stuck with the milk and they never move on from arithmetic to calculus and they never move on from calculus to algorithms. That is wrong. That's the complaint. But look at verse three. This we shall do if God permits. Why does he put that before verse four? Verse 4, it seems like a radical change in subject, except it isn't. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and that word is very similar to photosynthesis in Greek, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them, since they crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Oh, boy. Well, let's just look at that last verse. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. He has no recriminations about Jesus. Jesus was perfect. The teleothesis, he turned out to be exactly what he should have been. Satan has no accusations. He has nothing he can say in heaven about or against Jesus. He can't accuse Jesus in heaven. But he certainly can accuse us. When we mess up, when we sin, he's accusing. Oh, look at your son, what he's doing now. Look at that, your daughter. Do you think they're holy? Look at that. That's what he does. This is uh, demonstrated to us in Zechariah with the priest with the filthy rags, the filthy garments. Again, I only mentioned that very briefly, but it relates to that. Uh, But a backslider, one who falls away, that brings embarrassment to God. It dishonors Jesus. It gives Satan ammunition to accuse the children of God. Look at your son. Look at your daughter. Dropping the cross is one thing. 
backsliding, going back to the world, we bring shame to the Lord before the throne. We give Satan munition. He can't accuse Jesus, but he can accuse us. Look at those you saved. Look at those. They are born again. Look, he would say, look what he's doing now. Left his wife and kids shacking up with a babe. Look, look at him. Look at her. Look at her. Sleeping around again. She's doing this. She's doing this. That's your daughter? <laughs> A backslider not only dishonors themselves, not only do they dishonor the body of Christ, but they give Satan ammunition to accuse, or as the accuser, and it brings shame to the Lord. What parents wants to be embarrassed about their children oh my son the dentist my daughter the lawyer my son doing 10 to 20 for armed robbery in san quentin <laughs> when we sin we mess up and satan accuses but a backslider is on a whole other level, this text says. They bring shame to Jesus. Now let's look. Let's look at this very carefully. Maybe I'll look at the Greek very briefly. I will. I read this in Greek a little earlier. Hope I can get it up quick. Bring the Greek up quickly. Ah. Bring it back up quick. Hebrews 6, 3. And this we will, shall be doing. Kai toto, polisemon, eanapor, epitripe, ho theos. If God, uh, if God allows, or if God permits, epitripe, okay. Now verse 4. For it is impossible. Adunatan der. That term der is a conjunctive in Greek. It links verses three and four. But on what basis does it link verses three and four? Verse three is talking about milk in contrast to meat. Verse 4 is a diatribe against backsliding. Why is there a conjunctive linking the two? Remember, Jesus said to make disciples, not converts. As we always point out, Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. I've known people who said they had evangelistic ministries. I know some of them well. And they always count decisions. And this thousands were saved and thousands were saved. This many came forward and all. Come back in five years. Come back in one year. Where are they? How many are left? Billy Graham admitted only a few percent of all the people he led to Christ continued to follow Christ. Now, of course, that would still be a significant number for him, but it wouldn't be a, such a significant number 
for most evangelists. And even with him, he bemoaned the fact there was a relatively small percentage. If the milk is not there, if there's not discipleship, if people are not taught basic doctrine, what is the basic doctrine? It's the milk. What is that? The resurrection. Eternal judgment. Repentance. Faith. Now notice, in the present age of apostasy, those things are not being propounded. Those things are not being emphasized. Those things are not being inculcated to new believers the way they would have been at better times in church history. Some of the milk, repentance from dead works. Rick Warren, the purpose-driven lie, when you see an unsaved person living immorally or into substance abuse, don't tell them they need to repent. Tell them they need Jesus in their life. Then he'll come in, then he'll clean up their life. Again, as we pointed out again and again, the confusion of justification with sanctification. If there's no repentance, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It's a false conversion. What's more milk? Eternal judgment. Oh, there's no eternal judgment. Just ask the author of the book, The Shack, William B. Young, if he's an annihilationist. Ask Roger Foster in England if he's an annihilationist. The late John Stott from England, who people, for some reason, I don't understand the reason, but for some reason respected him. What the reason? Why anybody would respect the man like that, I don't know. But they did. Proponent of annihilationism. You can't say there's eternal judgment. Once you take away the fear of eternal judgment, unsaved people think, well, when I die, I won't exist anymore. That's what they think anyway. It's a disincentive. This is how John Stott ended his ministry on top of his opposition to Israel and his replacement theology and his infant baptism and his Calvinism and all of his other garbage. Martin Lloyd-Jones never, never liked him, and Martin Lloyd-Jones was right. I wish more of Britain listened to Martin Lloyd-Jones, his contemporary, instead of the study what he do that. I shouldn't speak evil of the dead because now he doesn't believe those things anymore. He knows there's an eternal hell. I'm not saying he's there, but I'm saying he knows that there are people there and that he taught error to the people he taught error to the people in his church. He taught error to the children of God. He propounded that error in Britain, particularly and globally. It was just a man whose legacy I, I cannot respect at all. An opponent of Israel, he was in bed with Stephen Sizer, uh, who was a vehement enemy of, of Israel. And it's unbelievable. Well, that's how he ended his, his life and his ministry. But he had a big impact. I happen to be in Britain, so I, I'm talking about John Stott. I know the impact he had here. You look at the Church of England, same-sex marriage, homosexual ordination. They're compromising with everything increasingly. Why not? There's no hell. Take that out of the infant formula. Take that out of the baby's milk. Take repentance out. The Rick Warren thing, the, the William B. Young thing, the John Stott thing. Once you take away the milk,
the bones of the body get brittle. There's no calcification. There's no bone density. It is structurally feeble. And you can't put soft tissue, muscle tissue, onto the hard tissue because the hard tissue isn't hardened enough. Babies need milk for calcification. Look what happens to some postmenopausal women because of decalcification. Fall down on the basketball court when they're 19 and just get up again and keep playing the game. Fall down, fall down. In a geriatric age, they, they break a hip or something for this, over what would have, would have been a minor mishap, a sports injury or something. You need milk for calcification. And you cannot put any meat onto bones if the bones can't handle the meat, but you get rid of the milk. Once that happens, once you do the things that Roger Foster and John Stott and, and, and Rick Warren do, once you do that, you are not just setting the stage for a backsliding and a falling away, you're creating a scenario where it's impossible for it not to happen. If people are not grounded in basic doctrine, in milk, they will fall away. If churches are no longer being taught basic doctrine, they will fall away. Just think of the gospel. We'll be coming to this when we get into chapter 7, 8, 7, 9, and 10. Does his blood cleanse from all sin? Or do you atone in purgatory for your own? If an angel of God comes with a different gospel, let him be accursed. The idea that you have to atone for your own sin is a different gospel. Oh, it's okay to be Catholic. We have... The Church of England no longer believes its own 39 articles, which is in part a polemic against Roman Catholicism's false gospel. And they got the 39 articles. This is what we believe when they get ordained, but they don't believe it. You let the milk go sour and pour it out the window. Then you want to know why you have a titular head of the church who said he's not the defender of faith, Christianity, he's the defender of faiths. Islam, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, whatever. It's King Charles. <laughs> There's no milk. This guarantees a falling away, both individually and corporately. If a believer is not discipled in basic doctrine, they are a super candidate to fall away. And if a church is not grounded in basic doctrine, it is inevitable that church will turn to garbage. It'll become irrelevant. There's a children's game in England, but it's also played in other countries, including the United States, but it came from England, and it was called, it's called Cluedo, Cluedo. It's like a detective mystery game to solve a crime, a murder or something. And they have all these characters in it, like Professor Plum and things like, who did it? The Professor Plum did it in the kitchen with the, with, you know, with the, with the hammer or whatever. And the manufacturers of the game got rid of one of the characters, <laughs> card characters in the game, Reverend Green, because most people in England can't relate to or don't understand what a vicar is or what a pastor is anymore. Now, that is a sociological statement about the state of the church in Britain. And Europe is in worse state than Britain is. Post-Christian neo-pagan, the milk is gone, this is what you're going to get. 
Well, most of the time, the milk is now gone. That repentance, the importance of believer's baptism. The Alpha Course is Triludian. It doesn't teach believer's baptism. False gospels, eternal judgment. It's a gun. What do you wind up with? You wind up with what you got now, what we have now. Now let's continue. <clears throat> Verse four. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Well, let's look. Verse 7. This relates now to Matthew 13. It explains Matthew, verse 7 of this chapter 6, explains as an apostolic commentary on Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls upon it, and brings forth vegetation useful. Now remember the rain is Isaiah 44, living water is the Holy Spirit. To those whose sake it is also tilled, receive a blessing. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless. And close to being cursed and ends up being burned. That was the third seed. It grew up in the thorns. It gets choked off. It is almost cursed. Unrepentant backsliders reach a point where they're almost cursed. And if there's no repentance, they end up being burned. An unrepentant backslider. We're talking about backsliding. Does not have the assurance of salvation. Unless they repent. Until they repent. They put themselves in peril. That word there. It's quite a word. Parapipto is the word, but it's just a case variation. Uh, I'd like, to, I'm just going to look at it, re read it in Greek. I'm going to read verse four in this passage in Greek. Adunatan, unable or not possible to happen. Adunatan get, as we read, those, those, or those ones, hepax, one time, once. It happened at one time. Same as the theological term, hepax legemini, something one time in scripture. Okay. Photisthentes. This is aorist. Passive, accusative, plural. Those who were enlightened. They were people who were enlightened. Gusemenos. They tasted. Okay. They taste next to the Doreas. Doreas is a word like for a present, or it could be understand something giving like a tip almost, like a tip, like a gratuity or a tip. But it's something given, 
voluntarily. Okay. Doreus tes eporenio, like Uranus, of the celestial or of the heavenly, kai metokos, metokos, the participants. They were participants, genefentes, numatos hegio. This is aorist passive. It's a deponent accusative. They are in the process of becoming or being, being, being becoming. It's hard to translate. Numato of spirit, Hegi of the Holy Spirit. Hai kelon, gusemanos, deo, there's the word gusemanos again, tasting, ingesting. Deo tema dunamis, the power. Te malontos, of the imminent sun or of, of, of the world to come, of the age to come, of the eon, eonis. You can't make anything else out of this. Parapito, backsliding. You fall to the side of. It could also be understood to mean it's the second aorist active accusative. It means that you sort of not just fall to the side, but you divert, divert. Okay, you divert. You will go in the right way, but you divert it. The case of those who've been enlightened, they saw the light and they tasted of the gift. I once heard of a Calvinist who said, oh, they just chewed it and tasted it, but they spit it out. They didn't really believe it. <laughs> no, no. That is not what the word means in Greek. They swallowed it. And it goes on to say that they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the word of God and the powers of the age to come. You can't have the Holy Spirit unless you're born again. The Holy Spirit can convict people and draw them. But these were people who ate it. They ate it. They tasted the good powers of the age to come. Somebody who's convicted of their sin and, and, and decides not to get saved and not to repent. They may have tasted the Lord to see that he is good. But they've not tasted the powers of the age to come. They're in this age. And then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them. They go beyond a certain point of no return. Okay. Now, let's begin in verse 9. But beloved, now remember, these are not people who are just convicted by the, they were partakers. They were participants in the Holy Spirit. Somebody pours out a vintage glass of, 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 of expensive wine, Cabernet Sauvignon or Calderon or something. And I hope I'm not offending any teetotalers. And you pick it up and you look at it and you see how mellow it is and you swirl it around. And then you sniff it. Okay. That will give you a sense if you want to drink it or not. Okay. But once you swallow it, <laughs> you're no longer just looking at it and sniffing it to get a sense of the flavor. You become a partaker. It has entered you chemically. And physiologically, it is going through the gastric mucosa. It's being absorbed chemically into your system. 
It's the same with the Holy Spirit. He convicted an unsaved person and they're being drawn. And But once they accept him into them, accept the Lord into themselves, they're a partaker in it now. Just like you have a chemical change when someone drinks the wine instead of just sniffing it. Being convicted of sin is one thing. Responding to the conviction and repentance and faith, being born again is another. Now you've entered the age to come. These were people who at some point were born again. But they go to the point where they won't repent. Now they're almost, almost condemned. Almost. It's horrible. God is forbearing. God tries to get them back. Okay. But they're very close to being cursed, it says in verse 8. But now in verse 9. Beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. So this is not just talking to them, it's talking to us. <laughs> We're convinced of better things concerning you and I. Though we are speaking this way, it's a hard way to speak. It's a difficult, painful subject to address. But even though we're doing it, don't become upset or overly troubled in the wrong way. We're convinced of better things concerning you. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love you've shown towards his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. One of the ways that we show and one of the key ways that we show our commitment to the Lord, our work, is the way we minister to other believers the rich helping the poor, the franchise helping the disenfranchised, sending mission offerings from developed world to developing world. Like anything else, we are hard as your treasure will be also. I love that saying. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Pepe Smitha, we are convinced, or we have been persuasively, yeah, we've been persuasively convinced, okay, de Petty about you, uh, or, or about humon agapatoi te critona kai ecomene sotirias aikohotos lelomen. We are convinced about you because of what you do, the things that accompany salvation. We're convinced better things of you and the things that accompany salvation, even though we're speaking this way. Then it goes on. Alger adikos, not for unjust. Hotheos, God is not unjust. Epilithese, to, to, to be forgetting. To ergo human, the work that, 
of your work or of the work you did. Kaito Kope Tezagapes his endekesti endekesti esto anoma oto diaconesantes tois hegios kai diacontes. He's not unjust to be forgetting about your work and the toil, the effort, okay, of the love. Work must be born out of love. Love for the Lord and love for the brethren. Be careful here. You've got Roman Catholicism's idea of treasury of merits, they call it. And their idea that you can save up your account in heaven for a higher or better position in eternity by works. While it is true that our work shall be rewarded in eternity, that is true, that should not be our primary motive for doing it. Our primary motive should be our love of the Lord, our love of the brethren, and of course, our love of the unsaved and our desire to see them become believers. Okay. Love must be the motive in our actions, not just to save up for our eternal retirement, as it were. Now, he then continues. Going into something patriarchal. I'll just finish this chapter. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. That word is hoko, hoko, oath. God took an oath. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. Thus, having patiently waited, now remember this is written to believing Jews, thus having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Because it's written to believing Jews, the epistle is pointing to their father Abraham. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath, a horkos, given as confirmation, is the end of every dispute. I have the oath, I have it in writing. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of promise the unchangeableness or the immutability of his purpose interposed with an oath. If God swore something before you and he says, this is eternal and I swear, and I swear on my own name because there's nobody higher than me to swear on. In a matter of speaking, you can take that to the bank, you can take it anywhere. In order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he can't lie, we may have strong encouragement who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. <clears throat> we cannot set restrictions on God. He can do anything, including set restrictions on himself. While we cannot restrict God in any way, in his eternal sovereignty, he can restrict himself, and he does. He can't lie. It's impossible. He's made it impossible for himself to lie. Now look, we fled for refuge. Abraham had to leave Mesopotamia. Get out of here. We left the kingdom of Satan. 
we are refugees. Now we are refugees in a land we shall one day inherit the way Abraham did. His descendants would inherit it. But we are living as refugees in this fallen world. We are all refugees. This hope we have as an anchor. An anchor. Al Quran. Al Quran. Now the word here, this hope, Elspin, <clears throat> we have as anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Again, it goes back to the high priest, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, becoming a high priest forever, once more according to the order of Melchizedek. There are two things that guarantee our status and our destination. God's oath and a hope that is an epidos, uh, open epidos, a confidential, it's like a, a confident expectation or anticipation this hope we have is a confident expectation that is an anchor there are storms and there will be storms small boats get knocked around but if it has a strong enough and a heavy enough anchor it's not going to sink or be washed away. Our hope is in something that is compared to an anchor. It is our expectation, our confident expectation. Okay. It's indicative perfect, <clears throat> um, past perfect. Something he's already given us that, that we can hold on to these two things. You heard God's oath. And we have this hope that is an anchor. That means even though we can be battered, we cannot be sunk. Think of Paul and the shipwreck in Acts 27. He was battered, but he didn't drown. The ship can be battered. It can be battered to pieces. But it couldn't be totally destroyed because they made it to shore hanging on to the pieces. This relates, the, the, the same Greek language here, is, is the terminology is similar to Acts 27 with Paul shipwreck. Remember they had to hoist the anchor? In Acts 27, it's the same idea. The hoisting of the anchor in Acts 27 relates to this. When God gives an oath, he gives an oath. And when he provides an anchor, he provides an anchor. Battering may come. Destruction cannot. And then he brings this back and he connects it to our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. The Aaronic high priest couldn't do that. The Melchizedek high priest could. And Jesus, as our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, did it. We will continue with chapter 7. Lord willing, next week, where we will be looking at the once and for all sufficiency of the high priest having entered once and for all. Now, remember, people put the chapter divisions in. I just wanted to finish the chapter. So I did. But it's not really where the chapter, in my opinion, should have ended. The chapter should have ended 
in my opinion, in verse 12. Chapter, th verse 13 should have been in chapter 7, in my opinion. But others may disagree. It doesn't matter. I just did it that way because I just wanted to finish the chapter. From verse 13 onward, is more in harmony with what it says in chapter 7 than what it says previously in chapter 6 and 5. I hope that uh, clarification helps somebody. Be that as it may, Lord willing, we will catch you next Thursday. Sandy?